but uh, we're almost, we're, we're getting towards the end. I mean, now we're on a chapter called Settling Disputes. And uh, we've gone through all the different ways disputes can arise. We've gone through personal training, dealing with anger, all kinds of things. And um, now we're getting on to settling those disputes. So it's very positive. And uh, it's interesting because today um, the sutta that I'm reading out is quite strong in the sense that it's um, a case where the Buddha uses firm action and encourages firm action. And it's actually called Sweep the Chaff Away. I love that. <laughs> or at least that's Bhikkhu Bodhi's little, uh, little uh, summary of, of this particular passage. So it's on page 158. And uh, what usually happens in these discussions rather than classes is that I'll read a little bit and maybe comment if some comments come to mind. And you can also comment and discuss what's being said at any time. So please just raise your virtual hand if you have something to say. And otherwise you're welcome to write in the chat box and I will come to your comment at an opportune time. Uh, sometimes I might want to finish my sentence or the paragraph, but uh, I do try to uh, include all of you because this is for us all to learn together. It's not that I know what the Buddha meant. It's more about thinking about how we can apply it to our lives in a meaningful way, in a way that really does uh, bring more harmony into our lives. And time and again, you know, this theme of harmony comes up in relation to making an end of suffering. In other words, it's an absolutely fundamental, indispensable part of being able to practice to the depth that does enable us to free ourselves from suffering. Because if there is no harmony in our lives, in our families, in our communities, in our hearts, right, then we're always working with those surface issues. We're, we're, all our energy and time is taken up with trying to solve those things before we can even get a moment's practice. And if we do try to practice in situations which are really unhealthy, even abusive or toxic, um, we're not going to make much progress and as a result may end up blaming ourselves. So I think it's a really uh, beautiful message, actually, that we are um, valuing and validating external conditions as an essential part of the path. You know, the Buddha did talk about sapaya, which means suitable conditions. And uh, one of the most important is suitable companions, which means people practicing virtue, um, at least, you know, aiming to practice virtue as much as you yourself are. And we'll always have different strengths and weaknesses. Our partners might be stronger in some areas, weaker in others. But on the whole, we're, you know, walking on this path and in our lives with um, companions that are virtuous and that can bring out the best in us. Yeah. So I'm going to start by uh, getting straight into it and uh, reading this little passage. And it's from... The Anguttara Nikaya, Anguttara Nikaya, number eight. So there's probably eight things involved. So on one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling at Champa on a bank of the Gagara Lotus Pond. Now, on that occasion, monastics, it was probably monks, but here we'll say monastics to make it gender neutral, answered evasively, diverted the discussion to an irrelevant subject. Oh, sorry, have I? I've missed a bit. Okay, I'm going to start again. On one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling at Champa on the bank of the Gagara Lotus Pond. Now, on that occasion, the monastics were reproving a monastic for an offence. When being reproved, that monastic answered evasively, diverted the discussion to an irrelevant subject and displayed anger, hatred, and resentment. Then the Blessed One addressed the monastics. Monastics, eject this person. Monastics, eject this person. This person should be banished. Why should another's son or daughter, in, if it was a bikini, vex you? So here you can see him using fairly firm language. He's come to a decision and he's clear about what to do. And he's asking the monks to, or the monastics to, to 
remove this person from the assembly? Why should another psalm vex you? So I looked in the little appendix to see, um, not appendix, that's in your body, isn't it? Appendix, is that right? <laughs> Why should another son vex you? It basically means most probably that his behavior is so bad in this case that um, he can't really be considered or she, if it was a woman or they, um, they can't really consider this person a true um, disciple of the Buddha, right? Because as monastics, we're actually living as family, basically. The teacher takes on the sort of role of a father or a mother um, and everyone uh, um, who is a disciple of the Buddha is in a sense the child, the Buddha's child. So when it says uh, another son, it's almost like saying he doesn't belong in that community anymore. Maybe he's um, come from another community before then, or maybe it's through the behavior, you know, that this person is no longer worthy of being thought of as a disciple of the Buddha. So then he goes on to explain further. And I think I will just say monks here because I'm pretty sure this is actually within the monk's sangha. Here, monks, so long as the monks do not see his offence, a certain person has the same deportment as the good monks. When, however, they see his offence, they know him as a corruption among ascetics, just chaff and trash among ascetics. Then they expel him. For what reason? so that he doesn't corrupt the good monks, right? This is quite interesting, I think, because this shows that once we understand where a person's at, we also can have that understanding that we are going to be influenced by other people around us, right? And uh, for good or for ill, depending on that person's conduct. So if we do surround ourselves by good people, then we're going to probably uh, become good and maybe even upgrade our behavior. Even people coming to this little place, to our Vihara in Oxford, have said that when they meet the other guests and they um, see the kind of quality, the virtue of those people, their own virtue improves just as a consequence of being around other good people. Everybody wants to live up to that, right? So the understanding here is that we are influenced it's inevitable you know even if you're training in the buddha's path and you feel that you're fairly advanced on the path and many of these monks and nuns in the time of the buddha would have certainly already have attained the first stage of enlightenment yet still they could be influenced right and it's almost like a disease that can spread so it's really pointing to the vital importance of having pure-hearted friends yeah and again, to the importance of harmony as a cause for ending suffering. So the next bit is a simile that relates to that. Suppose that when a field of barley is growing, some blighted barley would appear that would be just chaff and trash among the barley. As long as its head has not come forth, its roots would be just like that of the good barley. Its stem would be just like that of the good barley. Its leaves would be just like those of the good barley. When, however, its head comes forth, they know it as blighted barley, just chaff and trash among the barley. Then they pull it up by the root and cast it out from the barley field. For what reason? So that it doesn't spoil the good barley. Hmm. So too, so long as the monks do not see his offence, that's the other person's offence, a certain person here has the same deportment as the good monks. When, however, they see his offence, they know him as a corruption among aesthetics, just chaff and trash among aesthetics. They expel him. For what reason? So that he doesn't corrupt the good monks. So I don't know if any of you relate to this, but I think it's very interesting, isn't it? How in the beginning, you know, everything, people might look just like us. Hi, Philippe Power and Sean. Hi. <laughs> oh. Philippe is our youngest uh, attendant here. <laughs> very keen on the Dhamma. <laughs> nice to see you again. Yeah. 
So I don't know. It takes time to know a person's true colors, doesn't it? You know, on the outside, they may look a certain way. And as monastics, you know, there is a certain deportment that we're supposed to um, cultivate. And I have to admit, I don't cultivate it very strongly these days. But when I was a younger nun, I certainly sort of took on a lot of that. And um, partly it came as a result of practice. If you meditate a lot, then you tend to have a very peaceful countenance. And, you know, your eyes are often downcast. There's a lot of sense of restraint. Um, but... You know, other people around me had similar deportment. And one of my companions on the path always appeared very equanimous, very serene, but actually could blow up quite quickly when things, you know, got triggered inside her. And I'm not saying this is an example of somebody who was really corrupt, but it's just not enough to judge anybody by their outer appearance. We really can't know. And I think this is pointing to the uh, the fact that it takes time to really get to know a person, right? And to see what they are going to become, you know. Maybe in this case also, they have been living with this person for a long time, you know, and um, in the end, there were no lasting changes. In fact, it went the wrong direction. So it's not that you just pull that thing up immediately, right? You wouldn't pull up the barley at the first sort of sign. It might look as though there's potential there, but as soon as you see that basically it isn't the real thing, and in this case, not being a true aesthetic probably um, implies that this person's committed quite a serious offence um, of, of, against the, the Buddha's discipline training rules. Um, and so at that time, just as you just pull out the barley, you cast it out of the Sangha. So it's really quite unequivocal, isn't it? It's not like, oh, should we take it out or not? But it's seeing the potential of that to infect all the other barley. I actually had um, something like this happen during my retreat. I've been on retreat on my own now for two weeks and uh, I started noticing my plants, my lovely plants. Some of them were getting little uh, diseases in their leaves. And then I realised that, uh, you know, if I left a particular plant that had a certain disease close to another plant, that you have to move them like at least half a metre away, something like that, then it can infect the plant next door. So I was going around and... Uh, the roots were still good, even the leaves were quite good, but there was a pest on those plants. So I made some like, um, what do you call it, like organic um, spray. You can boil rosemary leaves in water and spray the plant leaves. And uh, yeah, but I separated them from the good plants so that the other ones wouldn't become infected. And there's other examples too. I mean, we actually haven't spoken about this widely, but we did have quite a serious issue among our, our community last year. I won't say exactly which part of the community, but um, it did spread like a disease. And uh, people that were otherwise formerly close friends and very trusted um, got influenced by the person who t turned out not to be as she seemed. Um, and sometimes people don't see this, especially I think if we've got a certain perception of a person, you know, and uh, it's sometimes very difficult to change that perception. We don't want to see. But as soon as, you know, other others of us did notice the problem, then we realised we had to ask this person to step aside in order to save the community, quite frankly. It was that serious. And it happens. It's reg it happens more often than you'd, you know, maybe realise because human beings are human beings whether it's a Buddhist organization or a non-Buddhist organization, people are the same everywhere. And, uh, you know, we we are deluded. We don't always see clearly. And um, a lot of the time we're running on our defilements. We're running on greed, hate and delusion, right? So it's possible for this to happen to anybody. And I think one of the issues here is not that, uh, you know, you can't, um, not that you have to be perfect, right, to be in the Sangha, because sometimes maybe people will get angry. But in this case, that person would um, not be reproved. You know, they weren't open to being trained. They weren't open to um, taking uh, instruction. And they would avoid the discussion, right, and show anger, hate, and resentment. So in the Buddha's teachings, it often says, you know, somebody who is not uh, receptive to feedback is actually um, not fit to be trained. Yeah, so it's really noticing where we can help a person and where we can't, 
and also perhaps having some understanding of the consequences if we do let things fester, it's, you know, especially because we are so influenced by those around us. So I've spoken quite a lot already, and um, maybe it would be nice to have a little bit of discussion before I read out the poem coming next. That's also a summary of that. So I'll come to Liz. Um, I don't know. Shall I do the unmuting today? I'll do the unmuting because it'll probably be quicker. That's it. Um, hey. I, 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 I'm a bit puzzled by that because uh -huh. uh, you think whatever this monk had done, it can't be as bad as Angulimala. And yet, Angulimala was welcomed by the Buddha. Uh, yeah, I'll just pencil. stop you there because there's a very simple answer to that. Angulimala was not a monk when he killed all those people. <laughs> yeah, Angulimala but... was still a lay person. So yes. It wasn't a breach of the Vinaya in any way. He actually transformed and he lived an Im immaculate monastic life. But there are um, disrobing offences whereby when once you've already ordained, you've obviously taken those precepts not to kill, not to steal, not to, for example, have any sexual conduct. And if you break some of those rules, you're doing it knowing that that is a disrobable offence. And it's just such a huge um, breach of what it means to be a monastic that not only affects you and your conscience, but it also affects the, the confidence of the lay community. So it's extremely damaging. And it's clear that, you know, whatever you're struggling with is too much for you to actually skillfully handle as a monastic. So it would be a very serious thing that this person had done as a monastic. And so he'd be wearing the robes and, and, you know, that's basically telling people that you're pure in certain ways, that you're upholding certain precepts. And if you're not doing, then you're deceiving both your monastic friends and also the lay people who support you. So that's the reason why it's so extreme here. Mm. And I think mm. it's really just an example to show you that sometimes that kind of measure is needed. I'm sure it's very rare. I mean, it's, you know, I've never seen that happen in any community. And, you know, most of the time, if people have committed one of those offences, they will naturally confess it and they will themselves leave the Sangha because it doesn't make sense to be there anymore. Mm. You know, it, it's extremely rare that somebody would have to be asked to leave. So clearly this person had very bad intentions. Mm. Yeah. Okay, thanks. All right, I'll come to Shirley. Hi, Shirley. Shirley. Hi. Um, yeah, I mean, you sort of answered my question, but not quite, because I was thinking it must have been a disrobable offence that they were pretending that they were actually in denial about. Or do you think it could have been another very serious offence like... I think it's probably both the seriousness of the offence and also the fact that they're not willing to be reproved. I think that's a big one. So even if it was a less serious offence, um, which it probably isn't, but even if it would be sort of over time, if somebody was in a monastery and they were making fairly serious breaches and doing things, you know, just basically being deceitful, right? Maybe they haven't killed, yeah. maybe they haven't raped or robbed but maybe they're just not someone you can trust, somebody who's, you know, um, causing a lot of suspicion maybe on the Sangha, really kind of spoiling the, the reputation and who is really co a cause for a lot of disharmony. And they are repeatedly unable to, to change, then I think that could also be a case. Yeah, I mean, maybe something like killing an animal or having a relationship with somebody of the opposite sex that wasn't full intercourse. Because they were. But that's be, still a disrobable offence. Are they, are they, even if you kill an animal? Oh, no, not um, or if an you, animal. May well be, actually. Or I, if, if, you I, know, if you, if you kiss somebody of the opposite sex on the lips, or if you kissed anybody on the lips. Yeah. And, and then, you know, I mean, I think it's clear that it's, uh, 
I'm probably going off on a red herring, but you know, it's a little I bit. Know, yeah, I mean, sorry. obviously, <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's a bit of nuance in there because it depends on how you interpret some of these rules. I think for a monk, that might not be a disrobable offence. I mean, it's really bad though if you actually yeah. have any kind of sexual contact. Yeah. For nuns, it also looks like it would be a disrobable offence, but then some people say you have to add up all these different things someone does. Yeah. But really, if you have any kind of contact like that, which is based on lust, it's it's serious in the Sangha. Yeah. I yeah. don't think this is an issue of that. I think this is a character problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think this is much deeper. I mean, to me, this speaks of sort of narcissism or, you know, really evil intentions, bad intentions that a person isn't even trying to train. There's a difference between trying to train, you know, and being willing to uh, confess and to make amends and to fall in line with Sangha and just sitting there with no intention to learn, yeah. to train, to, yeah. to take advice. So, but even I think in, in communities generally, if somebody is repeatedly um, creating conflict, creating problems for the community, causing people a lot of trouble, then the community has the right to ask them to leave. You know, I mean, that has happened in monasteries before. I think Ajahn Brahm's even had a couple of monks leave. And Ajahn Brahm's Ajahn Brahm, he, he really doesn't do that lightly. But sometimes I think it's more when you see that it's not benefiting them to be there, right? There's no benefit for them. And there's no benefit for the community as a whole. So there's just not the right time. It's not the right place. And the person usually knows that. Kilaya, can we come to you? Am I saying your name right? Yes. Hi. Um, I, I think this sutta is really interesting to think about if yeah. the fact that there is no specific offense listed is meaningful. Like, yeah. what does it mean if being evasive and diverting the talk when you're confronted with an accusation is such an such a important sign telling about character underlying character because honestly like this is almost our almost our default these days i find like you just mm. find no matter what someone comes at you with a discussion it's immediately like oh i, I have to be defensive i have to defend myself here and yeah. i think he's this sutta may be pointing to how far from the correct behavior this really is for a monastic like you really have to feel connected open and safe and and not respond with a really defensive attitude right. uh, anyone confronts you and that yeah. uh, um treats this so harshly to me says well maybe this is really really much more important sign of things than we take today mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I wonder how far that would apply to lay life. I mean, certainly it would apply in, in the sense of creating just as much disharmony, I think. I think in the Sangha, it is specific to the practice that we undertake voluntarily when we train, because this is part of the training that we have to confess our offences. And one of the signs of a stream winner is that they cannot conceal even the slightest thing. It becomes almost impossible. They become like an open book. You know, what you see is what you get, and there's no difference between the outer presentation and the inner cultivation, which I think is, an, you know, a, a key point here as well, isn't it? That this person's looking a certain way on the outside, but on the inside, they're quite different, you know. So there's almost like an open deception, an intentional deception of the people around them. But, yeah, if you would apply that to living in the world, you know, if you're actually... Um, if good people come to you trying to uh, offer constructive feedback, constructive criticism, then we ought to at least be able to pause maybe and, and see if there's something in there to consider for ourselves. I mean, in other parts of this book, it, the Buddha gave very clear guidelines on how to give feedback. So it's not as though we should just be open to anybody coming at us with any kind of accusation because sometimes it's not coming from the right place and and they are at fault. But um, yeah, that's a really interesting one because we can notice in our bodies, can't we, when we get a bit defensive, you know, it's like it's, it's, it's affecting our sense of self. What is it we're trying to hide? What is it we're trying to, you know, shield from? Yeah. 
Madeleine, can we come to you? Right, thank you, John. I was just going to ask, how do we apply this uh, this teaching to our life, our lay life? Because it seems very specific. You, you kind of answered it a, a minute ago, really, but it's very specific to monastic living. And what message can we take from it to Wow. apply to ourselves? Yeah. I guess that's what I want you to all think about and discuss. <laughs> you know, try to have a look at what message you can take. I mean, it might not be immediately evident, but it's something to really reflect on and, and you know, look at yourself in your life. I mean, I did write a few little notes for myself. And I think one of the things for me that, that stands out, and of course I'm a monastic, but I think this could apply to anyone, is that it's almost... that the Buddha is giving us permission to choose our friends wisely. He's telling us that we don't have to put up with people who are toxic for us, who are, you know, yeah, a cause for a lot of conflict in our lives, who um, undermine that sense of harmony within our own communities, whether that be our families or our workplaces, sometimes strong actions needed. I mean, that's a big message for me with this because I tend to be very soft and, uh, give people a lot of chances right but more and more I'm realizing I cannot go over that line because it affects the whole community I have to take care of myself and also the people around me and if I see something that's off most likely it's going to influence others as well so for me it gives I find it very validating actually and almost emboldening in a good way um Because the Buddha's not just saying, you know, it's your karma if you're around somebody who's, you know, abusive, just put up with it, suffer, give them compassion. Yeah, sometimes that won't work. A person has to be willing to change. And if a person is refusing to change, you know, and um, not even admitting that they have a problem, then I don't think we can be of a lot of help. Sometimes our compassion can be misguided. These are things I personally take from this, but I think it has to relate to things in your life that you may be working with. I mean, it might be the opposite for other people. Maybe they're too quick to push others away, you know? Maybe we push people away sometimes who do have good intentions, who are trying their best, you know? But I think, yeah, another thing for me is that um, it's asking us to use our discernment you know, as to people's characters and also surround ourselves by good spiritual friends. I think if we're serious on this path of Dhamma, yeah, the Buddha said that spiritual friendship's the whole of the holy life for a reason, because he said that's going to um, mean that we will practice the Eightfold Path. And I just noticed for myself, if you have someone in the community or in your life in general who does, I don't know, I guess it's, people when they have particular maybe personality disorders or particular patterns say gaslighting for example it creates so much confusion and busyness for everybody because you're constantly having to process it and to ask other people did I do that did I say that I didn't mean it that way it creates so much energy drain Uh, and I like the fact here that it's like once you see that this is not real barley or whatever, it might have looked like it. But once you see it's not, you just take it out. You don't have to like say, I hate this person. This is terrible. It shouldn't happen. <laughs> you just take it out. Knowing that that's for the good of you and those around you. Yeah. yeah. But sometimes it's very difficult to find... Uh, supportive spiritual friends in the community particularly yes. when uh, you don't have access to um, a monastery or something like that yeah so you end up yeah um, working very hard to offer meta to somebody who you might actually think is um, just needs a lot of support and meta but in the end you kind of have to come to the decision that this person is not good for me and yes although I'll see this person from time to time Right. I think I limit my um yeah my interaction. Yeah, Yeah. and I think um you know our first pattern usually if there's a difficult person is to send them a lot of meta, but we forget that we also need a lot of meta. 
And maybe if we can send ourselves a lot of meta too, then we can make that decision more quickly. I think for me, it's also about having enough sort of self-respect, you know, yeah. and um, yeah, realizing that we have to protect ourselves. We have to protect our practice because it's yeah. so precious. I mean, like here it's saying you have to take it out because otherwise it'll infect the rest of the crop. Yeah. You know, it'll infect our own practice. It'll infect our thought processes. It'll affect our energies. It might even affect our friendships with other people because they want to avoid that person, you know. Yeah. So I think with meta, we have to be careful that we we send as much to ourselves as we do to others. I just yeah. wanted to say I was listening to um, one of the talks uh, online the other day, and somebody said Ajahn, Ajahn Chah uh, said, you know, people want to offer meta, offer meta, and they might see. Uh, a snake, a cobra, and they think, oh, it's going to be really nice to stroke this cobra, mm -hmm. but the, the cobra is going to bite yeah. you and kill you. Yeah. So if you're offering meta to somebody who's a, a dangerous or maybe a bad influence, yeah. it's really important to realize, have some wisdom here yeah, and exactly. protect yourself. So it's, but it's the balancing act is, for me, is, um, is quite tricky sometimes. Yes, it's a learning process, isn't it? Because every situation is unique. You might think, oh, I got it now. But the next situation will come up and be slightly different. I like Ajahn Brahm's phrase where he says, love the tiger from a distance. But you first, you still need the wisdom, right? Because you need to discern who's the tiger, who's the friend. <laughs> that exactly. That takes time, yeah. But I think the main main thing is always send metta to yourself. Don't neglect that because that will be a protection for you as well. Yeah. And Thank as for community, I mean, this is what we're trying to do. This is why we have the online Zoom. This is why we're trying to establish a monastery, because whoever can come by, they can find spiritual friendship there. Even if you only come by sometimes, even if you only come to these sessions sometimes, it's just seeing the same people, just having that validation. I mean, I feel it every time I see you all, you know, even if you're not here, even if I'm on my own, I feel like, oh, yeah, these people are still on the path. We're all practicing together. We've been practicing together a long time. And it gives you that sense that, yeah, this must be a good thing to do because many other intelligent people do it. Yeah, so hopefully, yeah, spiritual friendships, spiritual uh, communities can develop more and more. Yeah. Diana, can we come to you? Uh, maybe I pressed someone else's button. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, so much wisdom being shared today. I don't have much new to add that other people haven't said, but I do love the phrase chaff and trash among the barley. And I'm going to try and remember that so that I can mm. apply it to situations that <laughs> seem to fit the description. Yeah. I think it's really true that the plant can come up and look like a healthy plant and start to grow like a healthy plant and then reveal itself as a blighted plant. And sometimes at that point we are attached to the plant because we've been nurturing the plant. And uh, what you said about moving your literal plant away from the other plants because it had a disease is very true. Like, you know, it can feel hard-hearted, but it isn't really. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's interesting. I love when you draw attention to the words because you're a poet, I know. <laughs> and uh, when you said that, it just revealed another aspect, you know, the fact that barley is nourishing, it's sustenance, it's food, it's delicious. And trash and chaff is the exact opposite. It's inedible, right? It has no nourishment. Yeah. It's something you would throw in the bin. That's what it's fit for. Yeah. A plastic bag <laughs> tightly. Right. So that yeah. Or yeah. yeah. And also the part about the attachment. Yeah. Because here they're not doing that. <laughs> they're seeing the danger and it's an immediate danger. They're not saying, I did that with my plants too. I mean, it didn't take me a few, it's not like, oh, I'll leave it for another week, you know, next to the diseased plant. No, I moved it straight away. I mean, I have a plant like that right now in my patio that has really nice yellow flowers, but the leaves are all covered with a powdery white. Yeah. And so I want to enjoy the flowers. And I've been 
pretending that it's not a problem. And you know what? After this session, I'm going to go and bag it up because that plant is going to affect other plants. Yeah, there you go. That's another application of this. Sitter. <laughs> <laughs> Look after your house plants. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it took me a while. I actually had to throw a plant away too the other day. And it, it was, yeah, it took me a while, you know, to do that. But I, I didn't regret it. As soon as it had gone, I didn't really think about it, to be honest. I think sometimes we imagine attachments. That's interesting too. Sometimes habit, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey, Laya, come back to you. And also, for anyone who's shy to speak, please do write in the box. I see a message just came up. Hi, Kilaya again. I was going to add, I, I was thinking of another sutta that, that gives, I think it's connected somewhat. Uh, I remember... Ananda was going to go teach the Dhamma to, I think, his family or friends. And the Buddha said to him, go teach to those who think you should be heeded. Yeah, yeah. Which to me is really relevant here yeah. because often we get, well, in a lay, in a lay life, we get maybe self-defensive responses and people get angry because they're not really looking for what my advice what i have to say they're not yes. there's no there's no relationship like that there so i think like this relates to this sutta because they're he, they're talking to a monk that should be heeding everyone else like that's part of being in that community and if you yeah. don't have that respect if you don't if you're not heedful of what other people are saying about you then you probably shouldn't be there but in lay life, it's a little more complicated because we don't often run into people who heed us. I mean, I don't really know mm -hmm. anybody who heeds me, but I, I give advice and it's usually not taken well. Right, right. That's a really good point. And it was a point that the Buddha made more generally too, just to monastics in general, that we weren't supposed to teach. I mean, it's still there in the in the monastic tradition that we're supposed to ask permission uh, before we give a talk. Especially if you're junior to the abbot, or you're always junior to the abbot usually, you know, you have to ask permission. So people, or 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 someone has to request, the community have to request for you to give the talk, because otherwise they might not want to hear a talk, right? And then and then what's the point? What's the point? Yeah, it's a waste of everybody's time, and it might even turn people off. Actually, it might do less less uh, less good, less more harm than good. Yeah. I think the best way, I mean, I did all that too when I first started meditating. Oh, you know, you've got to do this course. If you never do this course, I didn't exactly say this, but I thought, oh, you know, you've wasted your life, basically. <laughs> you know, and I just hoped that someday when my parents retired, they'd do this course, you know, and as in retreat, because that's what you used to call them. And uh, now I don't even think that they should do it, you know, because they, they have their own ways of uh, living a beautiful, wholesome life. And they have come to the teachings, but not because I asked. In fact, it's funny, they usually plan to come without telling me. It's quite interesting. And then my mom said to my sister once, oh, I could go to these talks every week, but don't tell Venerable Chanda. <laughs> so she doesn't want me to know because then I might get excited and kind of ask her, you know, to do it. <laughs> I think people want to be autonomous, right? We all want to have autonomy and to feel we're making informed decisions because we want to make them. They have to make sense to us. Otherwise, we're just not receptive. It's like it's not the right time. It's not the right time for it to sink in. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Don't give advice unless you asked for it. Some, somebody's saying in the chat. I also think when we use words too much, we in a way undermine our message because the stronger message is the way we live. You know, like if we're kind and unintrusive and, you know, kind of willing to listen to others, willing to kind of meet them where they're at, then that already is a lesson, but it also makes people more open to us, I think. But I don't think you have no influence because it's lovely to hear what you share here. So thank you very much for that comment. I'll just go to the chat box. Uh, I've been thinking when people act wrongly and can't acknowledge it, trust goes out of the relationship. Yeah. It's hard to sustain such a relationship. I've had this experience and now avoid that person. Yeah, that's really true. 
I have a similar experience, actually. Yeah. People sort of writing very aggressive emails and then acting as though nothing happened. I never said how much it affected me because I, I don't think I should need to, but I would sort of think they might consider that and acknowledge it and apologize. But uh, yeah, because they can't acknowledge it, it. I think part of the reason for me that the trust goes away is because I don't know whether they actually are aware of their behavior and whether they can actually understand the impact it has. You know, and if they can't understand how they're hurting others, then they're likely to do it again, isn't it? They're likely to do it again. Yeah. Yeah, I really think that openness, I mean, I'll get onto the little poem in a minute, but a lot of the problem in this case is about somebody being duplicitous. In other words, concealing what they're really about, doing things secretly, but presenting as though there's something else, you know. Um. And of course, there can't be any trust there. Our actions and uh, behavior and values, they have to align, you know. I think it was a monk. Was it a monk in the suttas? Oh, no, I think it's a story, actually, I've heard about, um, you know, sometimes people say, well, you know, I can behave when people are watching me, but, you know, I can do what I want when I'm on my own. But uh, in Buddhism, it's like there's always someone watching you, right? You yourself are always watching you. So don't do anything in private that you wouldn't do in public. I mean, okay, some things like go to the toilet, right? But <laughs> actually, I usually go, I used to go to the toilet in any old field, maybe behind a bush, hopefully. But uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's why in the suttas it says, you know, we should... Uh, have loving thoughts, thoughts of loving kindness in public and in private, acts and words of loving kindness in public and in private. So as we speak to a person, so we speak about them. You know, you don't tell a person, I really respect you, you've got this and that quality, and then you go and say something totally different to your friend. Oh, this person's so annoying. <laughs> you have to be, uh, be honest without hurting others. Okay, I'll come to one more question from Liz or, or comment, and then I'll continue to read because I'd love to get through most of the chapter, actually, if it's at all possible today. Me, I, it's a story rather than a, a comment. Um, you say about teaching and some, by the way you live. Now, back to my uh, charity where I make coffee and so on to, to everybody. There was a colleague, she says to me, why don't you drink cow's milk and so on? She said, we're in France. You are uh, missing out on all these beautiful Frenchies. And uh, I said to her, do you know, feeling in peace with nature is even better than Frenchies is. <laughs> And she looked at me, she said, you know, I've never thought about it like oh. that. And I thought to myself, you see, we don't need to teach complicated things or use big words. It is just by being peaceful and listening to to what is going on around you. Mm. And I was I felt really pleased. <laughs> <You know? Aww. laughs> Uh, and yeah, it's yeah, yeah I've, I've been vegan for quite a long time yeah. now and it's true it gives you a peace inside an harmony yeah. with uh, and I thought that was a beautiful story I looked at her and I thought this is wonderful you know yeah so it's just my story <laughs> yeah thank you yeah because it came from your heart it came intuitively and yeah. it's like uh offering a different perspective isn't it yeah, yeah. Just About looking at things yeah, that's great. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. All right. Well, I'm going to get on to this little poem now, as I promised, because I think there's some main themes that come out for me. And uh, being an analytical type, I kind of tried to put numbers where I saw the themes. But the basic themes, I think, for me are like, OK, what enables us to take this strong action was a question that came to my mind, because I think it's quite difficult sometimes. And I jotted down a few points. What enables us to take strong action? And I think the first one is like understanding how we're influenced, right? And the importance of spiritual friendship. 
The second one is like valuing ourselves, our practice, and also our community. Valuing truth and non-deception, especially to the lay community, as this poem will show. Having support from our companions, that helps us to take a strong action. And the discernment, having discernment, and if you like, I mean, it sounds strange in the English language, but when you say someone's a good judge of character, I mean, judge is a funny word, but I think it really means you're able to discern. Maybe you have certain principles you go by, certain kind of standards that you keep for yourself, which will be different for everyone. That doesn't have to be judgmental, but I think kind of being able to um, gauge maybe what kind of companions are, are good for you and are, are suitable to build a, a, um, a spiritual community that's harmonious and that's profound. So anyway, we'll see if we can find these themes. <laughs> So, by living together with them, know them as an angry person with evil desires, a denigrator, obstinate and insolent, envious, miserly and deceptive. They speak to people just like an ascetic, addressing them with a calm voice, but secretly they do evil deeds hold pernicious views and lack respect. Though they are devious, a speaker of lies, you should know them as they truly are. Then you should all meet in harmony and firmly drive them away. Get rid of the trash, remove the depraved fellows, sweep the chaff away, non-ascetics who think themselves ascetics. Having banished those evil desires of bad conduct and resort, dwell in communion ever mindful, the pure with the pure. Then in harmony, alert, you'll make an end of suffering. Mm. So one more little thing I want to bring up here is um. The relationship between mindfulness and discernment, right? So it's not that mindfulness is just being aware of what's happening, but it's actually being alert as well, being alert to the dangers that might beset a community or a field of barley, if you like, right? So it's, yeah, and the importance of harmony, it's saying in harmony and alert, right? So the harmony is like a sense of warmth, of loving kindness, of um, communion, right? It's something that's full of loving kindness, but you have that alertness. It's almost like the guard, the protector, and that's an aspect of mindfulness. So mindfulness has this uh, quality of being aware, but it also has the quality that's known as the gatekeeper which knows the wholesome qualities to cultivate and the unwholesome qualities that should be discarded. So it's not that we're just an open book and we say, oh, whatever comes in should come in, right? So I really love this little poem. And again, it's talking about, um, clearly an example here of somebody who isn't really an aesthetic, they're pretending to be an aesthetic. So it probably does mean that they're involved in all sorts of sexual conduct. They're really impure, right? They're literally just hiding behind a robe. They're living an untrue holy life. They're not a real monastic. And unfortunately that happens, you know? I mean, I don't think I've heard of it in the Bikini Sangha yet because there aren't, it isn't so widespread. Um, you know, maybe it'll come later, I hope not. But certainly, uh, especially in places where there's a big stigma on leaving the robes or there's a lot of benefit to staying in. There's a lot of power. There's a lot of money involved. Then these kind of things happen. You know, people are walking around in the robes, but being anything other than aesthetics. And I mean, in Burma, actually, there's a, I mean, Burma is no exception at all. Um, I mean, I've heard in Thailand there were monks gambling and having sexual conduct and all sorts of stuff, <laughs> trying to hide their earnings from being taxed, <laughs> counting out their money in the evening secretly. 
and gambling and all sorts of stuff. But in Burma, there's also these um, what they call fundamentalist monks. I think it's the wrong word, really, because, I mean, well, I don't think the word fundamentalist should go with a religion, put it that way, because there's nothing religious about it. Um, but they're basically inciting, um, yeah, sectarian hatred, like ethnic hatred. Um, and the authorities in Burma have tried to expel them from the Sangha, but they keep on kind of disappearing and popping up under another name. But, you know, they're not monks, but they walk around in the robes because as soon as you've actually incited violence and killing, I mean, that is a disrobing offence. Otherwise, the robe means nothing, right? And the robe itself doesn't make you a monastic. It doesn't make you an ascetic. So I did want to um, continue with the next... Um, verse if that's not too much for people here because it is another real life story of how this can apply and it's an example that did happen in the buddha's day where somebody was actually asked to leave and the buddha asked them to leave so this gives you another um example um of how someone of a bad character can disrupt the sangha and can actually really cause a lot of damage to the community. In this case, the Buddha actually refusing to teach. So that's another consequence, right? Of having uh, bad people in the assembly, the, you actually miss out on the teachings. So this is called forced eviction. And it's actually one of the suttas soon after the Anguttara one that I mentioned. The first one was Anguttara 8, number 10. This is Anguttara 8, number 20. So I'll just read through and then we can have some more discussion to finish. On one occasion, the Blessed One, that's the Buddha, was dwelling at Savati in Migaramatta's mansion in the eastern park. Now, on that occasion, on the day of the Apostata, that's the day that the rules are to be recited for everybody here, the, the um, training rules. The Blessed One was sitting, surrounded by the Sangha of monks. Then, as the night advanced, when the first watch had passed, the Venerable Ananda, that's the Buddha's main uh, attendant, rose from his seat, arranged his upper robe over one shoulder, reveren reverentially saluted the Blessed One, and said to him, Bante, that means Venerable, the night has advanced. The first watch has passed. The Sangha has been sitting for a long time. Let the Blessed One recite the Patimokha to the monks. Again, that's the training rules. When this was said, the Blessed One was silent. As the night advanced still further, when the middle watch was passed, so now it's probably 2 a.m. <laughs> and the monks are all waiting for the recitation. The Venerable Ananda rose from his seat a second time arranged his upper robe over one shoulder, reverentially sal sal saluted the Blessed One and said to him, Bante, the night has advanced still further. The middle watch has passed. The Sangha has been sitting for a long time. Bante, let the Blessed One recite the Patimokha to the monks. And a second time the Blessed One was silent. As the night advanced still further, when the last watch had passed, when dawn arrived and a rosy tint appeared on the horizon, the Venerable Ananda rose from his seat a third time, arranged his upper robe over one shoulder, reverentially saluted the Blessed One and said to him, Bante, the night has advanced still further. The last watch has passed. Dawn has arrived and a rosy tint has appeared on the horizon. The Sangha has been sitting for a long time. Let the Blessed One recite the Patimokha to the monks. So they might be a bit fed up by now because they've been sitting there like all night. I don't know how anyone here would feel if they've been sitting waiting for the whole night and still I hadn't started the sort of discussion. I don't think any of you would be here by now. I don't think, would you wait for me for the whole night? <laughs> <laughs> If I just sat there with the book. <laughs> anyway, so then the Buddha one replies, finally, in the dawn, this assembly, Ananda, is impure. Then it occurred to the Venerable Mahamogalana, 
Now, the Venerable Mahamogalana, for those who don't know, is the Buddha's left-hand disciple, <laughs> means one of his two chief disciples. And he was the one that was famous for his psychic powers, as well as, of course, his very deep wisdom. So he was fully enlightened, very powerful monk with all the psychic powers. So then it occurred to the Venerable Mahamogalana, what person was the Blessed One referring to when he said, this assembly is impure? Then the Venerable Mahamogalana fixed his attention on the entire Sangha of monks, encompassing their minds with his own mind. You think I can do that? <laughs> then he saw that person sitting in the midst of the Sangha, one who was immoral, of bad character, impure, of suspect behavior secretive in his actions, not an ascetic, though claiming to be one, not a celibate, though claiming to be one, inwardly rotten, corrupt, depraved. Having seen him, he rose from his seat, went up to that person and said to him, get up, friend, the blessed one has seen you. You cannot live in communion with the monks. When this was said, that person remained silent. A second time, and then a third time, the Venerable Mahamogalana said to that person, get up, friend, the Blessed One has seen you. You cannot live in communion with the monks. A third time, that person remained silent. Then the Venerable Mahamogalana grabbed that person by the arm, evicted him through the outer gatehouse and bolted the door. Then he returned to the Blessed One and said to him, I've evicted that person, Bhante. The assembly is pure. Let the Blessed One recite the Patimokkha to his monks, to the monks. Then the Buddha said, It's astounding and amazing, Moggallana, how that hollow man waited until he was grabbed by the arm. Then the Blessed One addressed the monks. Now, monks, you yourselves should conduct the Obhasita and recite the Patimokha. From today onward, I will no longer do so. It's impossible and inconceivable that the Tathagata, that's the Buddha himself, could conduct the Obhasita and recite the Patimokha in an impure assembly. So that was that. From then on, the Buddha never led the Patimokha. So that was a, a very big and sad consequence of this uh, behavior of such an impure person. And I think when he says it's impossible and inconceivable that the targeter could conduct the apostata and recite the Patimokha in an impure assembly, it actually means that he wouldn't be able to do it. There wouldn't be no, um, it's like the Dhamma wouldn't be able to flow from a Tathagata. So, I mean, these things are sometimes hard to understand, but even Ajahn Brahm says, and I've noticed it myself to some extent, not to the same extent, but he says that when, um, you know, the people in front of him sort of dictate the way the Dhamma comes out. And sometimes even if he wants to give a deep talk or they ask him to give a deep talk, it sometimes just doesn't happen because a lot of the teaching is a kind of dialogue and I think, you know, it depends on the receptivity of the listeners, it depends where they're at. You try and, you know, I try intentionally, I mean, to aim what I share with people where I think they might be at, what I think might be useful. And I'm sure most people do, but it, there is something about it sometimes flowing and sometimes not. And you can never be quite sure. Actually, with this group, it's wonderful. I always feel very grateful that I, I feel this sense of receptivity and warmth and goodness and that gives me the ability to, to share because it wasn't my natural inclination out of just shyness. I mean, it's not easy, right, to start giving talks and, you know, wondering how it's landing, especially on Zoom. But uh, something about the people you're talking to affects what comes out. So this is what happened. And um, I guess this is kind of how the Dharma can slowly start to degrade. Um, and decline when people with the wrong intentions come in. So another reason for keeping things as 
um, pure as we possibly can. And I guess that's the purpose of the training rules. You know, it's not that we have to be perfect. We're never going to be perfect. Nobody is. <laughs> but at least in the ethical aspect, you know, our ethics should be very lofty, very high. We should be aiming for very high ideals. And um, the main thing is to be transparent. You know, when it says that, you know, a stream winner cannot conceal even a small offence, it means they still make them. But it's not an offence as long as it's uh, as long as it's acknowledged and confessed. We're training, so it's not what you are or aren't able to do. It's the honesty about it. It's the transparency. It's the willingness to be trained, and that's the purpose, I think, of any practice, any community, any um, training in monastic life. It's to be trained. So. We've got through that chapter, which is wonderful, because next week we're going to talk about establishing an equitable society. But um, we do have another five minutes if there's anything else from anyone here. And I would really love to invite Shirley, just put a hand up. Just could I ask, would you mind, Shirley, if I just check whether there's anyone who hasn't spoken today that would like to, because uh, it's really nice to get a variety of people. And please, if... I can't come to you please write it in the chat I'll read it out at least if you have another point to make so I'll try and do three then <laughs> I hope that people won't disappear maybe um Manoy can already write some information in the box in case people have to go so Jenny hi can you hear me yes perfectly well hi thank you I've been really enjoying this Great. um I just really noticed in that that it was very I haven't got it written down in front of me but I, I've noted down inwardly rotten yeah about the person and I thought whoa that's really harsh to say about somebody I, I'm surprised to hear such harsh language rather than say somebody who's lost their way or mm. yeah. tension or that it just really jolted me yeah. and I, I yeah don't know what you think about that yeah yeah <clears throat> Yeah, I guess it's related again to whether there's actually any hope or point in trying to help that person. And I think there are cases when there isn't, and maybe we don't like to see that, but maybe, and even that is not permanent, right? Because we can be reborn. <laughs> I mean, there were people in the Buddha's day who did such terrible things, they did go to lower realms, but then in future lives, they said that they will be future Buddhas. So it's not that anything is like once and for all, but I do think there are, you know, it's our behavior that creates that um, rot, if you like, in the mind. And I think this, again, is talking about somebody who really is concealing the truth. I mean, I think it's pretty bad. I mean, maybe this is something you have to be a monastic to understand, but if you've undertaken these roles, you're supposed to be like, a pillar of virtue. I mean, an example to all the people that are feeding you because people are actually feeding you. You're getting a livelihood from this based on your virtue. And if you're doing such grotesque things to completely defy what monasticism is all about, it is pretty serious. I mean, they're the kind of things that are considered very, very heavy. And maybe he uses that kind of language to really make no excuses for that, you know, really make it clear that that is just unthinkable for a monastic. So I think yeah, I'm maybe. not that surprised. Maybe I'm more used to the language. And I think it's also not coming from a place of aversion. Maybe that's the thing too. It's, it's mm -hmm. you know, it's very matter of fact in a sense. And I mean, there's other cases in the suttas where somebody does something quite bad and they come to the Buddha afterwards and do confess. I mean, like, for example, they kill their father, right? One of the princes, they kill their father, who was a disciple of the Buddha and a stream winner. Wow. That's King Ajatasattu. And later he comes to the Buddha and he, he confesses and he is very, very sorry. And the Buddha teaches him deep Dhamma. But at the same time, he cannot get enlightened. And the Buddha said, it's a shame because if he hadn't killed his father, he would have probably become enlightened after that talk. Yeah. So it's not that he would cut people out, but I think in this kind of case, he's sitting there, he's not even leaving. I mean, it's yeah. quite an extreme situation. Yeah, and I guess when it's the monastics, he's got to protect that. And maybe that's kind of, yeah, yeah. Be more forceful. Yeah. So. 
I think yeah. so, yeah. It's like, um, and it's also that idea of rot. It's a bit like the chaff, or it's a bit like the disease that can spread. Yeah. Like, you think of what rot is or what mold is, it's something that can kind of actually eat something away from inside. I mean, it would could basically break down the whole point of a sangha, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah you're right. Yeah, mm. that makes sense. Thank you. Mm. Thanks for the question. It's great. I'll come to Sean. Hello. Um, yeah. Oh, you uh, You're called Sean's. Sean's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, just Your second name. <laughs> um, yes. And then, no, I thought that was wonderful, by the way, uh, when you said you feel within this group the, you know, that tranquility and that things flow. That was, then it just really resonated. But I wasn't, uh, what I was going to say was that a lot of this resonates with me. So, so running a business, what I've noticed um, we try really hard at is to have this sense of harmony and positive environment. And whilst we haven't had people committing like gross defilements and things like that, we have had people that didn't fit in. And we've and what we've noticed is they drag everyone else down and they become very negative. And then we're having conversations about them which aren't positive. And then you're not, it's not something you want to be doing. Yeah. And we've got better at this now. So we had someone that where this went on for months and we ended up having to ask them to leave. And it, like you said earlier, it wasn't actually right for them. It's yeah. and we weren't really doing them any favours. And more recently we had some of them work we had to ask to leave within two weeks. Yeah. Just working. And we felt that it was impacting the whole environment. It was impacting us. And it's so important to protect that. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it, so it yeah. just really resonated with me, all of that stuff. And uh, and also that I've become more aware of it, and I'm a big part of this because mm -hmm. of the Dharma. So it's kind of saying how how I've managed to put some of it into practice, and it really is yeah. true. Yeah, great. Thanks for sharing that, because I'm in a similar position. I mean, not business, but I mean, whatever you call it, it's the same thing, trying to establish community, a group of people working together, living together, practicing together and I've noticed too that it just wastes more time when you know something's wrong but you don't do anything about it it wastes more time for longer and I'm getting quicker at seeing it and not having it and um, even I, I think that's better for everybody because you don't give a person false hope either right that it, yeah. it might be a, a suitable environment or community or, or sometimes it's just they need to do other work somewhere else you know work on themselves in different ways and it's amazing because it's not really happening as much either maybe because I'm getting sharper mm. and I'm more able to tell whether what we offer is going to be of benefit to that particular person and whether they're going to fit in. Yeah. Fit in in the sense, not like it's a club, but fit in in the sense that this is where they need to be right now for their growth and, and how we can grow together as a community. So I do think in that kind of role that, you know, you have, it, it, there's a certain responsibility you know, um, as a leader to establish, like you say, a safe place for everyone. Yeah. And I do sometimes check in with other guests if, you know, I have a doubt about someone, whether they're being a little bit aggressive or, and I just want to check that everyone's okay, you know, and sometimes they're like, yeah, they can be a bit like this, but it's fine with me. And, and other times it's like, yeah, it's making me uncomfortable, you know, and it's, and if it's making everyone uncomfortable, it's like, yeah, can we work with this or, or not or you know yeah but i have found it also it's become a lot easier like spotted much quicker yeah don't feel bad about it whereas yeah. before feeling really bad about it and i think yeah it's it just it's not a benefit to anyone it's so exactly. much negative to everyone even them and sometimes it maybe it gives them that reality of wow maybe i need to do something yeah you know? yeah it's true and i think it's um for me, it becomes easier when I trust my intention. I know it's not out of negativity. It's coming from a good place. It's coming from a place of protection, nurturing the crop. <laughs> Love her, I'll come to you. And please, if anybody needs to go, I will not mind. But it's lovely, of course, if you can stay. We'll only be five more minutes. Hello, uh, everyone. Hello, Venerable. Thank you Hello. very much. Hello, nice to see you. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I hope this is not inappropriate, but I just want to comment on the 
um, Buddha's silence. It was very dramatic. <laughs> Reminds me almost of a of a cartoon or a, or a TV show where someone's trying to make a very dramatic point in the end. Um, but on the part of the the rotten monk, my mind immediately immediately jumped to some people that I'm dealing with in a professional setting at work. Yeah. Um, who are just basically really driving everyone they work with insane. Uh, but my boss is refusing to, oh. and everyone knows this, but my boss is refusing to cut ties. Um, so when you do have the sort of authority to get rid of people who are causing um, bad, bad stuff to happen, um, then it's fine. But if you don't, I'm wondering what I can do in that situation. And currently I'm trying to just really isolate myself emotionally and be very, very objective and minimize contact. Mm, that's um, so tough. It is tough. I mean, I have been in a similar situation once and um, what I did was talk to the people I trusted about it and I found out they felt the same. And when we all talked together, we found we all felt the same. <laughs> Um, we couldn't really do anything in terms of going to the boss. Well, I suppose we did actually. The thing is that person was the boss in a sense, but there was another boss high, a bit higher up who was Ajahn Brahm. <laughs> um, and we all wrote letters to that person and our letters were all different, but on the same page. And I think they realized that, you know, we can't all be wrong <laughs> and, um, that if nothing was done, the whole community would fall apart. So, I mean, anyway, it sort of did. <laughs> but I think it's really important, just like it says in this sort of, to get on board together, like as far as possible, you all have to be on board with a solution, you know, for this. And if you're the only one in that situation, and it's really eating you up sort of emotionally and psychologically, it might be that you'll need to move on. But if you can kind of talk to your colleagues and if there are enough of you who feel the same, you could try and write to the boss maybe and say, this is how it's affecting us. We're really committed to this job. We want to do our best, you know, but it might not be possible with this sort of effect that it's having on us. You know, can you find a solution? Because it's really sad sometimes to see communities fall apart. Like when people just quietly disappear, one quietly disappears one year, the next year, another couple, then three years later, another one. Whereas if you'd all stood by at the time, maybe, you know, unity in numbers and all, the boss doesn't want to lose all of you for the sake of one. So yeah. I don't know. I mean, you have to see in your situation what what might be appropriate or how much it's worth a, a sort of, mm. you know, taking it as far as you feel. Um but I yeah, I empathize with you. And just, you know, at least you're aware that you're trying to kind of close down to some extent to keep yourself protected. And that's good, you know, in order to keep yourself protected. But just be aware of when that turns into something that's psychologically not healthy for you. And then you're not able to come out of it anymore. And you're not able to know who you can trust around you. Then it's then it's starting to be quite detrimental to your well-being, I think. So if it's a temporary measure, maybe OK, but. It can't go on like that for too long. Yeah. Thank you so much for the advice. I'll yeah. try to mobilize. Okay. All right. <laughs> I'm going to just quickly read out the, the comments in the chat, and then I think we're going to have to end. I might not be able to come back to you, Claire. I'm not sure. Let's see. You've got a comment in here. Maybe is that okay for me to just read it through? I think that'll be the best. The Buddha said, "I this is the younger to sevens. The, I inform you. Monastics, I declare to you that for an immoral person of bad character, one of impure and suspect behavior, secretive in their actions, not an ascetic, although claiming to be one, not a celibate, though claiming to be one, inwardly rotten, corrupted, depraved, it would be far better to embrace that great mass of fire, right, than to embrace that person. Because on that account, they might undergo death or deadly pain, but for that reason, they would not, with the breakup of the body, be reborn in the plane of misery. Mm. 
So even if you die, it's better than actually becoming corrupt or it's better than, what does it mean? Becoming corrupt yourself? I, I think that's what it means. Anyway, we can look that up later. And then one more comment. When I first heard this last sutta, I thought it was very harsh. But after hearing about the monks in Burma inciting hatred and the bad behavior my Sri Lankan friend told me about in Sri Lankan, in Sri Lanka, sexual misconduct, I really feel someone should be ejecting these monks. Absolutely. As they're not true monks and they're damaging the Sangha. Absolutely. And I mean, not to do that just destroys the whole purpose of a Sangha. It just destroys people's faith. Remember, these people are living on the charity of others. It's really bad karma. And it's, it's, I mean, Ajahn Brahm often says the worst karma you can do is destroy faith. You know, like say, you know, I think most people here who know me even for five minutes know that I have absolute respect and trust in my teacher. Imagine if he did something that was just, I know he can't. So um, <laughs> it's not an issue. But if he would, I mean, even though he can't, it would destroy so many hundreds of thousands of people's faith. It really would destroy whole communities. I mean, the amount of misery that would... Uh, bring to others I think this is why sometimes it's almost like you're having to you're not you're not hurting this person by ejecting them. you're not killing a person right you're only ejecting them putting them somewhere else um that is far less harmful even to that person it's not harmful it's more harmful they stay in the in the place than all these other people losing faith in the path so we've got to protect the dhamma at every cost and I think there's not enough speaking out about these things among the lay community because they feel they shouldn't criticize a monk usually nuns get tons of criticism just for being a bit being nuns <laughs> right we shouldn't be fully ordained because we're women right that's enough to get criticized but really the criticism should lie with behaviors we don't have to make it personal we don't have to kind of you know this person is so terrible but this behavior is absolutely unacceptable and that's it and that's really the bottom line. So, yeah, good. So Diana thought that meant you are saving the person from an even worse fate in the next life. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, by expelling them, you're saving them from a worse fate. Could be that, yeah. Yeah. It's also nice to remember that, I mean, this is not to say stay in a difficult situation of abuse or whatever, but even if somebody, you know, tries to kill you or is violent towards you or whatever, they're the ones who are going to be suffering, who already are suffering far more than you. You might have the initial trauma, right? but trauma can be resolved. You haven't actually violated your ethics. You haven't violated your virtue. You've maintained that. If you can maintain that, then that's what you carry with you. So this idea of rebirth is very important in understanding these things. If it was all about, you know, only this life and how much fun you have, then sure, you can say this person's terrible. They've destroyed my life. They've destroyed my fun, et cetera. You know, my well-being, my happiness. But, you know, if we can restrain from doing the same, if only the world could see that, right? If war hurts us, we should not perpetuate war. Instead, people say, oh, they hurt us, we have to hurt them back. I mean, it's the most illogical way of thinking you can ever have. I mean, whatever hurts us hurts everyone else. So if we've been hurt, at least, at the very, very least, we can learn not to do that to others, you know, and we can learn to have immense compassion to ourselves and eventually even to the perpetrator too. Yes, exactly. War on terror is just madness. It's just making terror of terror, making war of war. And this is how it goes on and on and on. This is what samsara means, on and on and on, around and around and around. And, you know, somebody somewhere has to say, I'm just standing for peace. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I don't know, Minori was supposed to say a few words about how you can support us in our next step. Maybe if you can just give us a couple more minutes, that would be wonderful. Otherwise, there's something in the box. I'll make it very quick. I I hope you can hear me. Yes. Um, so I'll make yes, it very yes. quick and um, not a normal Dana talk, but I wanted to highlight the main needs today. Uh, these days in the Vihara, and uh, that is getting food and other requisites to Venerable and the Vihara. 
So there is a WhatsApp group to get in if you want to get involved. Um, uh, it is called Afa e Anukampa Food at the Ready. Please contact team at anukampa.org if you can, if you are able to get involved. And there is also a list of needed items where you can contribute as well. I have put the links to that and it is in our website. Uh, I'm just about to put the link very quickly. Uh, and um, uh, I thought of reminding about the standing orders. Um, I normally talk about the donations and why you should donate, but then um, uh, the standing orders are uh, becoming important because they kind of support the maintenance of day-to-day -day monastics and Vihara needs, the bills, you know, the normal things that you can imagine. So uh, there is the, the uh, you know, monthly expenses can be met by the standing orders. So that is what we're trying to make a base of um um some reliable standing orders these days um so many of these things are in the website anukampa project dot org uh, slash donate you can see that you can make the standing orders as well um and if you if you have any any um uh, capacity of helping please contact team at anukampa project dot org they can um, forward you to this uh, WhatsApp group and also to the needed items. Thank you. Thank you, Manoi. Just to explain a little bit more on this AFAR group, basically it's kind of a group where when we don't have any food, like in the fridge, shopping kind of stuff, um, we can put a note on that group and then anybody can offer to do a what do you call it a supermarket delivery or something like that or you can club together and do one and uh, we thought that that is worth setting up and strengthening now because when we move to the bigger monastery there'll be no local shop so now our guests we depend on them being very generous which is really you know a big ask actually because not everybody has a lot of um, spare uh, resources but they basically go shopping to buy the food in um, but in the new place we won't really have a shop nearby it's like at least half an hour's walk probably more like 40 minutes walk to a little co-op so um, this group is wonderful because you can contribute from a distance that's not why it's called a far but it, it should be a far a far <laughs> <laughs> food at the ready so it's kind of emergency dana if you like and the needed items are kind of things that can also be got on amazon or amazon's not the best right but you know, you sort of household stuff and some food stuffs as well. So, and if you want to be on that WhatsApp group where you get notified, then um, just write to the team at, you might be lucky, Ken might respond or someone will respond and add you to the group. All right. So wonderful. And also if you are local, I know Jenny, because Jenny's local and we're already well acquainted but if you are local we're also going to put together a local group so that when we move to the monastery if we need a lift or something like that which we will need because there's no public transport <laughs> we can call you up or if something's happened like not a light bulb because we can manage to fix a light bulb but you know something else we can call you up great all right well it's lovely to see you all my battery's running low apparently on the computer so before it fizzles and dies um yeah, let's wave goodbye. And uh, I am teaching tomorrow morning metta meditation. So for those who'd like to do a metta meditation tomorrow at 9 a.m. UK time. All right. Sadhu. 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 <laughs>